when you get to Romans 11, Paul says, God is not... What happened? What, 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 what happened to, to the rest of Romans 8 and 9? Mr. How-to-be-Christian-Cowboy-Man? You can't even touch that, can you? It probably scares you to death. Okay, cut. Be Cut. No, I'm sorry. It's just I'm not feeling sufficiently scared to death from this. Is there a way we can maybe put it in black and white or have some creepy music behind it? It's just I'm not feeling the fear. Nothing against the performance. I think the performance was great, Mr. White. It's just I, I feel like the editing could be bumped up a bit. All right. And action. It probably scares you to death. Mr. How to be Christian cowboy man. Death. Romans death. 8 and death. 9. It Romans probably scares you to death. death. You can't even touch that, can you, can you, can you? Cowboy man. Well, now we're cooking. Okay, thank you all for joining me. This is How To Be Christian. I am Ferris, your host. If you haven't seen the channel before, welcome. Please subscribe so you're alerted when new videos are posted. Click the notification bell, then all. Also, thumbs up the video. Do a little mouse check. Make sure everything's working properly with your computer. I'm not asking for the like because it helps the video. I'm asking because I want to make sure things are okay on your end. Also, to make sure your mouse's click and drag is still working, copy the URL, paste it into your Facebook page, share it with friends. So today's video deals with a topic that some Christians and even non-Christians will have trouble understanding sometimes, but it's actually not that complicated. The topic is how can predestination and free will work together? Because some people think that if God predestines things, then that means we can't have free will. But that's not true. Both of those things can work just fine together. We'll get to that in a little bit, but first, let's hear what James White has to say about us. And James White is of Alpha and Omega Ministries. We've gone over his false teachings before. We have links to all those videos in the description. He is constantly editing the Bible to try to make it say whatever he wants it to say. We've already looked at Romans 8 and how Mr. White is just completely misreading the text there. So check that out if you haven't seen it already, because today we're moving on to Romans 9. It's how to be Christian on Twitter. We're on YouTube mainly, but we do have a Twitter in case anyone was interested. You skip over Romans 9. That he skips <laughs> Romans chapter 9. He's going to jump over Romans chapter 9. I see why you skipped this. You had to skip this. Now, do you see why this young man skipped Romans 9? Romans chapter 9, which he doesn't seem to be a part of his Bible because he never even mentions it. He just jumps it. It's like, it's just been decanonized. It's just moved, moved out of the Bible. It's sort of fun to watch. Okay, so because I didn't read from Romans chapter 9 in a video that had nothing to do with Romans chapter 9, Mr. White assumed that this meant that my Bible didn't include Romans chapter 9. Mr. White, if you're watching this video, I'm not going to read Genesis in this video, but it's still in my Bible. So Romans chapter 9 is in my Bible, and we're actually going to read the part that Mr. White brought up today. But before we do that... Let's talk about Men in Black 3. In Men in Black 3, there's a character named Griffin the Arcanan. He's a fifth dimensional being, and he can live in and visualize an infinite set of time-space probability simultaneously. What does that mean in this movie? It means that Griffin can know what has happened, what is happening, what could have happened, what could be happening, and what could happen. For instance, the Men in Black were on a mission to save the Earth. They had to do this by deploying a shield known as the ArcNet. During that mission, they're sneaking around a rocket launch site at Cape Canaveral, and they get spotted by security. So as security's coming up to them, they're thinking, okay, we're just going to lie to security. But Griffin says, no. Any reality that gets the shield deployed is the one where you tell the truth. Then Agent K, one of the men in black, says, the truth? And Griffin replies, the truth is the only path. So how is it that Griffin knows this? Because Griffin can know what is happening and what could happen. What he knows is happening is that the men in black agents are planning on lying. But since he knows everything that could happen if they lie, he tells them not to lie because any reality that gets the shield deployed is the one where they tell the truth. The truth is the only path. So one of the men in black, Agent J, tells security, my name is Agent J, this is Agent K, that's Griff. We're from a secret government organization that places and monitors alien activity on and off planet Earth. We have this special little metal thingy that Griff gave us, that's the ArcNet, the thing that's got it deployed to save the Earth, and he says they need to get that on top of the rocket to prevent an alien invasion. So Agent J tells the truth, and then we immediately cut to the next scene where they're being thrown onto the ground, held at gunpoint. Agent K sarcastically says, that worked, and Griffin says, like a charm. Now Agent K was being sarcastic because he thought it did not work. But Griffin here, who says like a charm, actually meant that it worked like a charm. He knew that they were now on the right path to get to a future where they end up saving the Earth. Because Griffin can know all possible futures. He knows if they lie and say, we're with housekeeping, this lie will not lead to any future where the shield gets deployed. 
He knows if they lie and say, we're health inspectors here for the rocket kitchen, this lie will also lead to a future where they fail to get the shield deployed. These, by the way, are both solid lies for sneaking onto a rocket. The point is, though, Griffin knows that if they lie, and you can insert any lie here, every single lie that they might tell leads to a future where they fail to get the shield deployed. Now, Griffin does know of at least one future, if not more, where they do get the shield deployed. And any future that gets the shield deployed is the one where they tell the truth. So telling the truth at this point in time can lead to several possible timelines. Griffin's not saying once they tell the truth, the world will be saved. There's still other paths that can come from that. And some of those other paths, maybe even a lot of those other paths, may still lead to them failing to get the shield deployed. But at least one possible future that stems from them telling the truth will get the shield deployed. And there can even be several different paths that stem from telling the truth that are different from that one path, but still end up with the shield getting deployed. So this is just a very small glimpse at how Griffin sees time. Because this is one situation, imagine multiplying that by every single possibility that could ever happen, or could have ever happened, or could be happening right now. As Griffin says in the movie, it's a gigantic pain in the you-know-what, but it has its moments. So what Griffin knows for sure is that if he looks at any future where the shield gets deployed, all of those futures have one thing in common, and that is that they are all only possible if they tell security the truth at this point in time. If they lie to security at this point in time, they're never going to get the shield deployed. They're going to fail at their mission, Earth's going to be destroyed, ouch. But that is why Griffin can tell them, don't lie, because any future that gets the shield deployed is the one where they tell the truth. So here's what Griffin is able to do. He is able to know what has happened. He is able to know what is happening. He is able to know what could have happened. He is able to know what could be happening. And he is able to know what could happen. There is something Griffin is not capable of doing, though. Griffin is not able to know what will happen. So he's able to know what could happen. All these possibilities could happen. But he can't tell you for sure which one of those things will happen. Moving out of Men in Black territory, though, there is a guy who is able to tell you what will happen. And that's God. God can have all of the same abilities that Griffin has, plus he can be able to know what will happen. At least according to Jesus. Because Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. All things are possible with God. What is impossible with man is possible with God. And even when praying to his father, Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. So if Jesus has that correct, which I believe he does, and all things really are possible for God, then these six things here, these six abilities, they would fall under the category of all things, which would mean that these six things are possible for God. Now, just because something's possible, that doesn't mean it's actually done. It's possible for me to go rob a bank, but I'm not going to go rob a bank. These six things are possible for God, but that doesn't mean that God necessarily has to use these six abilities. But all we need to know for this video is that they're possible for God. So if somebody like, say, James White came up with the teaching, he should factor in these possibilities. And if he's not factoring them in, then he has to prove that God can't have that ability. So again, proving the possibility is all we need for this video. So basically, it's possible that God can do all these things that Griffin the Arcanum can do, plus know what the actual future is going to be. Which means that at the beginning of time, before you or me or anyone did anything, God could have known everything that we would do. And not only that, everything that we could do. So like if I picked up this tire pressure measury thing with the window breaker and the seatbelt cutter, which I'm not advertising for this, this is just a prop for later in the video, so forget about it after this. But if I took this and I just threw it at the camera and broke the lens, God could know what would happen in that future. Where would we be after that? Would you be watching this video at the point that you're watching it right now? Would it even have been posted? Maybe I'd have to go out and get a new lens that would delay the filming of this. What I'm saying now is probably not the same thing I'd be saying in that video because I'd be like, hey, what about a future where I didn't break the lens? So yeah, one little moment can change everything after that. This thing has a light? That is so cool. This pretty much just sits in my car all the time, which is good because it's for emergencies, and as long as there's no emergencies, that's nice. Anyway, these things are all possible for God, according to Jesus. So with that in mind, let's listen to what Mr. White's saying. God's electing grace is not based upon anything I do. It is not based upon him looking and seeing that I'm going to love him or continue to love him or be somehow better than anyone else. So Mr. White thinks that we're given grace from God and that this grace allows us to love God. I believe that as well. But what I don't believe is this second part here. The part where Mr. White says that God's grace is not based upon anything a person does, it is not based upon looking and seeing that a person is going to love God or continue to love God or be somehow better than anyone else, that part is completely made up. Mr. White made that up. It's not taught anywhere in the Bible. It's not taught anywhere in God's word. It's just Mr. White's creation. 
So let's see why what Mr. White is saying is false. We are taught from Jesus, who I trust a lot more than Mr. White, that all things are possible for God. Which, as we already looked at, means that it's possible for God to know what could happen. Just like Griffin in Men in Black 3, it's possible that God could know possible futures. And God could know all of this information from the beginning of time long before any of those futures ever happened. So let's say there's a person named Jackie, and long ago at the beginning of time, God knew of several possible futures for Jackie. God knew of a possible future where he doesn't give Jackie any grace, and she never follows him. God knew of a possible future where he freely gives Jackie grace, based on absolutely nothing that she's done to earn it, at age 5, and she follows him for a while, but then turns away from him at age 47, and never follows him again. God knew of a possible future where he freely gives Jackie grace based on absolutely nothing that she's done to earn it at age 6, and she follows him for a while, but then turns away from him at age 23 and never follows him again. And God knew of a possible future where he freely gives Jackie grace based on absolutely nothing that she's done to earn it at age 13, and she follows him, and she remains his follower until the day she dies. And God could know several other possible futures too, but that's enough for the example. Now James is saying, God's electing grace is not based upon anything I do, it is not based upon looking and seeing that I'm going to love him, or continue to love him, or be somehow better than anyone else. But what exactly is stopping God from predestining this future, instead of this future, because of the things that Jackie does in this future? Aside from Mr. White demanding it, there's nothing that actually stops God from doing that. The fact is, God could know all of this. And God could decide that because of what Jackie does here, he's actually going to make this future happen. This is the one he's going to predestine. So God would still be giving his grace to Jackie freely, she wouldn't be earning it, but still, God could be basing his decision of actually giving Jackie his grace. In other words, God can decide to predestine this possible future to actually be the future, based at least in part upon what Jackie will do with her free will once she has his grace. That, by the way, is how free will and predestination can work perfectly fine together. Because in each of these possible futures, Jackie makes free will choices. She chooses not to follow God, with her free will. She chooses to respond positively to God's grace, with her free will. She turns away from God later, with her free will. She chooses to respond positively to God's grace, with her free will. And again, using her free will, she turns away. In the last scenario that we have here, she chooses to respond positively to God's grace with her free will, and then with her free will, she stays a follower of God until the day she dies. So all four of those possible futures are filled with free will. By selecting one of those possible futures and saying, I want this one to happen when God predestines that future, Jackie's free will is still there. Jackie's making choices and God's making choices. It's like if I wanted to go to a restaurant, but the restaurant was closed. The owner of the restaurant could have had the restaurant open 24-7, but they decided not to. So that was their choice. They predestined that it would close at 9. Now I'm showing up at 10 o'clock by my free will, and I can't get in. I can't get them to make me food, because they decided it was closed. By them closing off that possibility, they haven't taken away my free will. I can't get any food from the restaurant right now, but I still have free will. So by predestining something, God might close off other possibilities, but he's not forced to take away all your free will. Free will and predestination can fit together just fine. So now let's go to that scary passage that Mr. White was talking about. Which one was that again, Jimmy? Romans 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans 9. Right, thanks. Romans 9. And what specifically about it? You skip over Romans 9. And you skip over the answer to the very questions that you're going to be asking. Because he talks about God's, you know, all these things here. The whys. It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Hmm, that would be directly relevant to what you just had up on the screen, huh? So what I just had up on the screen in the video that Mr. White is watching is this graphic here. And what this graphic is showing is what God did in Romans 8. According to Romans 8, he foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, and he glorified. And since we know from that passage what God did, we're now trying to see if we can learn why God does these things. Now Mr. White is saying that the why is not based upon anything a person does, it is not based upon God looking and seeing that a person is going to love him, or continue to love him, or be somehow better than anyone else. Or as Jeff Durbin puts it in the video that James is watching, It says that God foreknows, 
God predestines, God calls, God justifies, God glorifies. It's not dependent upon your will, your action, your failures, your successes. This plan is the plan of God that actually starts before you were even in liquid form. So James and Jeff are arguing on the same side. Now before we go any further, it's important to point out that they are both referring to God's plan for saving people. This is very important to recognize, because they are not simply referring to the reason why God created his plan, they are referring to the plan itself. And they're saying that the things that make up that plan, such as foreknowing, predestining, calling, justifying, glorifying, giving grace, Jeff and James are saying that those actions are not dependent on anything people do. That is a huge detail to pay attention to in this conversation, and we're going to see why that's so important. As usual though, neither of them have any proof for their claims. And that's what I was showing in the video that Mr. White's watching. So eventually we find out that all these things that Jeff put in the Y column are not true. But we'll get to that in a minute. First of all, Mr. White thinks that he's found something in Romans 9. He said this was directly relevant to what I had up on the screen, so let's listen in. That would be directly relevant to what you just had up on the screen, huh? The Y part? Yeah, that does not depend on the... Wasn't man's will in the list of things you say it was dependent upon? How come we can only go a few sentences later and Paul's saying, no, 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 no. It does not depend on the man who wills, the man who runs, but on the mercy in God. So it's, it's right there. First of all, this is Mr. White's idea of a few sentences later. We can only go a few sentences later. It's the middle of the next chapter. How is that a few sentences later? We're over 20 sentences away from the part that we were just talking about. And Mr. White just jumped to a sentence starting with the word it. It is a pronoun. It refers to something, but he just leapt over 20 plus sentences and wants us to believe that it in verse 16 of chapter 9 refers to these verbs in verses 29 and 30 of the previous chapter. Now I'm not saying that Mr. White's behavior here proves that he's wrong. He could be right. We haven't looked at that part in the video yet, but based on his track record, he's not exactly a guy who screams, trust me. So we're going to look at this scaly, scaly passage and we're going to start a few verses before him just to get an idea of what this it is referring to. Starting in verse 10, there was Rebecca, and she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. In verse 11, it says, Though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, The older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So we're not at the part that Mr. White mentioned yet, but so far we're fine. If from the beginning of time God knows everything, then God's going to know everything that's going to happen in the future. He knows what will happen long before it actually happens, which would mean that God knows whether the twins will be good or bad, even though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad. So now we're coming up on the part that Mr. White was talking about. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills, or the man who runs, but on God, who has mercy. So the it here refers to God having mercy and God having compassion. The it here does not refer to every single thing that God chooses to do with his mercy and compassion. One of the things that God chose to do with his mercy and compassion was to come up with this plan for saving people that Jeff and James are talking about. Elements of this plan of salvation, for instance, God glorifying people, can be dependent on the man who wills or the man who runs. Because God could have set it up that way. And God could have set it up that way out of his mercy and compassion, which are not dependent on the man who wills or the man who runs. To give another example of this concept, imagine that you're in a toy store and you say to your mom, I want you to have mercy on me. And your mom looks at you and she says, me having mercy does not depend on the child who wills or the child who runs, but on me who has mercy. In that situation, your mom's saying, it doesn't matter what you want, all right? It's up to mom. But there's nothing stopping your mom, in her mercy, from coming up with a plan and saying, if you're well behaved, then I'll buy you Legos. So it's entirely possible that even though the mercy that instituted the plan does not depend on the child who wills or the child who runs, the plan itself, which was created out of the mother's mercy, could depend on the child who wills or the child who runs. So nothing about this passage in Romans 9 hurts anything that we're saying. We're told that God will have mercy on whom he has mercy, and God will have compassion on whom he has compassion. So there actually is an answer to a why question in this section here. Why is God doing these things? Because God wants to do those things. 
and God doing these things does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs. That's great, but that doesn't answer the question we have on the slide here. Because the question on the slide is in reference to Jeff and James saying that God's plan is not dependent on the man who wills or the man who runs. If they had simply taught that the mercy and compassion that God showed in creating his plan is not dependent on the man who wills or the man who runs, then yeah, they'd be right. And there'd be no point for this video because we'd all agree. But in addition to teaching this part, which actually is in the Bible, Jeff and James also teach this part, which is completely made up. They teach that not only is the mercy and compassion that God showed in creating his plan not dependent on the man who wills or the man who runs, but also all of these elements of God's plan are never dependent on the man who wills or the man who runs. This part is 100% anti-Christian, and it's 100% anti-biblical, which we'll see in a minute when we get to Romans 11. But yeah, this part here where they try to say that everything about God's plan is never dependent on the man who wills or the man who runs, that's why Mr. White was making this one giant leap for Calvinist kind, saying that this it, in the middle of chapter 9, refers to these five words back in chapter 8. So to make sure this is clear, and James White and Jeff Durbin would agree with me on this, there's no secret combination of works that man can do where God's going to be like, oh, you cracked the code, all right, I got to give you my mercy and compassion now. That's what Romans 9 is telling us. God doesn't have to give us his mercy and compassion. And again, this is stuff that James and Jeff would agree with. They're actually very close to the actual teaching. They just go one step too far. The Bible says God will have mercy on whom he has mercy. James and Jeff say God will have mercy on whom he has mercy. The Bible says God will have compassion on whom he has compassion. James and Jeff say God will have compassion on whom he has compassion. The Bible says God having mercy and compassion does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs. James and Jeff say God's mercy and compassion does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs. The Bible says that when God has mercy and compassion, it depends on God who has mercy. James and Jeff also say when God has mercy and compassion, it depends on God who has mercy. The one step too far that James and Jeff take is they say, and when God has mercy, he can't decide to have mercy based upon anything people do. And that's nowhere to be found in the Bible. So Mr. White is saying God's electing grace is not based upon anything I do. It is not based upon looking and seeing that I'm going to love him or continue to love him or be somehow better than anyone else. But the most you can logically get from Romans 9 is God's electing grace does not have to be based upon anything I do, but it can be if God wants it to be. It does not have to be based upon looking and seeing that I'm going to love him or continue to love him or be somehow better than anyone else, but it can be if God wants it to be. Romans 9 lets us know the decision for how God distributes his grace is up to God, not man. But it still leaves wide open the possibility that God gives his grace out to whoever he wants based on whatever reason he wants. So while Mr. White and Mr. Durbin are tying God's hands and saying, no, you can't give out your grace based on things people are going to do in the future, God is saying it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. So in other words, who cares what Mr. White and Mr. Durbin say? God makes the final decision on how he gives out his grace. So while Jeff and James are saying, no, God, you cannot give out your grace based on things that people will do, we just won't allow it. God could just be like, well, that's really not my problem because I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So buzz off. Anyway, that's why we skipped over Romans 9 in our other video because it doesn't address the issue we were actually talking about in that other video. It does help to answer a question on a different topic. It answers the question of does God need to have mercy and compassion based on things we do? And the answer to that is no. But it doesn't answer the question of does God choose to have mercy and compassion based on things that we do? So for that question, we would go to Romans 11, which is what we did in the original video. When you get to Romans 11, Paul oh, says whoa, 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 God whoa, whoa, is whoa, not... Whoa, 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 whoa. What, what? So let's go there again now. In Romans 11, Paul talks about how salvation has come to the Gentiles. And Paul compares their salvation to a root and branches. He says if the root is holy, the branches are too. And then Paul says, but if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them, and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. 
And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? So according to Paul, branches were broken off, and they were broken off for their unbelief. We're told that God did not spare these natural branches, and he will not spare you either. We're told about the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity. But to anyone who continues in God's kindness, to them will be God's kindness. Again, though, that's if they continue in his kindness. Otherwise, they'll also be cut off. So according to the word of God in the Bible, your actions might factor into God cutting you off. Now, as Romans 9 taught us, God is still in control of his own mercy. God will have mercy on whom he has mercy, and God will have compassion on whom he has compassion. And guess what? God has decided that at least some of the people he plans on having mercy and compassion for are the ones who continue in his kindness. We can even read that the natural branches, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Again, God's still in control here, and it was just his choice to base the distribution of his mercy and compassion on the actions of people. Did God need to do this? We answered that in Romans 9. No, he did not. But did God choose to do this? Romans 11 says yes. So back to Mr. White, who said this. God's electing grace is not based upon anything I do. It is not based upon him looking and seeing that I'm going to love him or continue to love him or be somehow better than anyone else. James, I hate to break it to you, but it's not up to you, man. You do not get to tell God how to operate. When God has mercy and compassion, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs. So maybe, James, you might want to consider not telling God what he can't do. Because, I don't know if you've read Romans 9 or not, but God's mercy does not depend on James White's will. It depends on God. So yeah, Romans 9. Romans 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans 9. Good recommendation. Thank you for that. Thank you to everyone who's watching. Please share this video. Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, wherever. Don't forget to check out all of these videos, which we have linked down below, which look at some of Mr. White's other false teachings. Now, I did have a joke planned for the end of this. I was going to do the normal, this is how to be Christian, you all have a great day thing. And then I was going to, I was going to flashy thing, y'all. Got my shades here. But then I realized that wouldn't make sense because I just taught you some stuff and I wouldn't want to erase that from your memory. So, going to nix that idea. All right, so this is the end of the video and I actually had a joke planned here. I was going to, do the normal, this is how to be Christian, you'll have a great day thing. And then I was gonna take this, and I was gonna pretend it was my neuralizer. I got some shades here. I was gonna put that up like that and just, you know, flashy thing you. And then I realized, you know what, that doesn't make any sense because I just taught you a bunch of stuff. So why would I wanna erase that? So, I'm gonna nix that idea. Okay, so this is the end of the video and I actually had a joke planned for this.